conversation. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ayush. I'm uh, one of the back end engineers at TikTok. Um, yeah, I just recently started something that role, so that's like temporary. Before that, I was an iOS engineer. And today's talk is really answering like the one big question, which is what do we mean when we say JPM yeah, or Table 6 in this case? Right? Okay, let's get started. So, a bit about me. Like I said, work at TikTok. Before that, I was actually from NUS. So, that's my CS101S uh, tutorial group. Uh, yeah, some of the old heads here would recognize people. Um, and yeah, that's me back when I still had hair. TikTok, um, right? <laughs> um, but before I was on TikTok, I really was working at a company called Arena. Um, anyone from there? All right, cool. Yeah, I see some notes. Great. Um, yeah, what's that? Uh, yeah, it's a little known company called Shopee. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's a Garena and Shopee is the same uh, corporate umbrella, basically. Uh, yeah, so, so I was in Garena, and it was during my time in Garena that I really um, delved deep on this topic. It's one of those topics where, like, your boss comes in and he's like, how are you doing these days? Are you sure you're doing okay? And I was like, you know what? It's shit. I've just been programming a lot of UIs, and it's not fun anymore, and, like, Trying to send her a day was just, just not doing it for me, man. So he's like, you know what? I have a very niche project. You want to read a lot of research papers and work on this. And I said, you know what? Fuck it, let's do it. So let me give you the problem statement that my boss gave me. Okay, it's the actual problem statement. 10 people from across the world will voice call and watch a video together. Okay? This is happening on the same platform as you're supposed to get a call and like, watch a video together. But can you do it within the same platform? So remember, this is like during COVID times when remote viewing together was the big thing. In fact, COVID's right there. We watched Avatar The Last Airbender together that way. And every time we'd have to pause and play, we'd literally go, okay, three, two, one, play, and we did play together, right? And we'll go out of sync and it's terrible, right? So let's let's set some ground rules for what a, a MVP or a minimum valuable product in this case is. Right? Minimum viable product, not valuable. I'm getting the MVP is most valuable pair. Anyway. So, yeah, the minimum positive thing. So, if one person pauses, it should pause for everyone. If one person plays, it should play for everyone. Second, jump into a timestamp. So, someone says, you know what, let's start watching this movie from 40 minutes in. Everyone should start watching from 40 minutes in. And last thing, there should be no noticeable lag, which really is the biggest problem because, as we into the YouTube, back when we used to watch Amber Fire together, there'd be instances where our one, two, three play wouldn't be very accurate. And it would go out of sync, and then someone would go, <clears throat> and then five seconds later, I would realize what the big plot twist is, right? And you don't want that happening. You really want this to be a communal experience. The problem with pause and play is speed of light is finite, right? Which means it's basically impossible to have like real time, real time communication. Like there will always be some delay if you're doing this at a global scale. So let's see. Um, in this case, you have one user who's using their phone, they hit pause, that contacts a server somewhere, that server propagates that thread and lets the other viewers in this. So uh, we call this the watch party feature. I'm going to use that term a lot. So other users within the watch party should also have their video pause for them simultaneously. Right? So let's say each of each one of these requests takes one second, right? Um, I'm being a bit like uh, pessimistic here. Uh, greatest decay will more likely to be equal to like 150, 100 ms maybe. But yeah, one second, why not? Maybe you're in some third world country, which is really where we were popular. Like, somehow all our users were from India, Indonesia, Mexico, Brazil, Myanmar, Thailand. Like, I, I don't understand why, but either way, yeah. So, very shitty internet connection, uh, one second delay, right? So, what does that mean? That means that if one person presses pause, it pauses on the other person's screen three seconds later, right? Every operation here is resulting in a three second lag, which if you watch like a three hour movie with a group of friends, you'll know like you know someone needs to go to the toilet or someone's doorbell rings or someone falls down or something happens, right? Uh, every time you pause and play, you're drifting, right? So 10 pause and plays, you're 30 seconds out of sync. It's no longer a communal experience. You're just on its own and watching different movies at that point, right? So the problem is human reaction time averages out to about 170 ms. If some of you here are tap gamers, you're judging me because you're at 100. If some of you here are my mom's age, then it's at 300. Uh, but either way, yeah, it's, it's usually under half a second. So yeah, uh, anything that's even remotely on the order of magnitude of a second, you're way off. Like it's not even remotely close, right? So what's the solution? The solution is timestamps, okay? So what do 
what I mean when I say time stamps? Instead of saying, I paused, right? What your message fundamentally says is, I paused at 11 o'clock, right? And that's a very, very big difference. What's the difference there? When the other person receives this message, right? Time's obviously moved on. For them, it's 11 and 3 seconds, right? But they know that the other person paused at exactly 11 o'clock. So what you can do then is you can rewind and you can pause it at the right time, right? So then it ends up becoming a synchronized experience again. We don't necessarily rewind. In most of these cases, what you would do is you'd actually very imperceptibly slow it down or speed it up to like 5 10% until they resynchronize. So that's actually how most of these communal experiences or watch parties are, are programmed, right? So, so far, so good. If everyone knows what 11 o'clock is, you just hit a pause, everyone pauses simultaneously, everyone plays simultaneously, right? So where's the problem? Where's the, where's the problem with this? There's, there is a big problem. The problem is, everyone remember Wordle? So I didn't prepare my slides like years in advance. Um, I prepared this last night in a tapping field nightmare. Um, but if you look at what's circled over there in the date, it says November something 2023. And I'm not a time traveler, uh, contrary to public belief. So the reason why I can do that is because my phone lets me adjust the time and date, and I adjusted it, and Wordle will let me play the older games. So back in its heyday, like when it was like a phenomenon, people would just like change the date and play future games or past games easily, like it wasn't even a problem at all. I'm sure like most of you here, if, if you were into the trend back then and weren't in like primary school, you would know what I'm talking about. I don't have any idea how old you guys are. <laughs> Actually, this, this picture of hands, how many of you here are year one? Okay, a few, all right. Because I will be talking a bit about like networking and protocols, so it's just one of five stuff, but okay, uh, I'll bear that in mind. Okay, yeah, so the problem is people can mess around with a clock on their device, right? So they can change it to whatever the hell they want. So let's say we have a malicious user who now has set their clock to say two o'clock instead of 11. Was that not? It's not malicious. So it may not be malicious. I mean, from, from our perspective, for, for our purposes, it's malicious. Um, but yeah, basically, if, if you've adjusted your clock, or there's a problem on your device, which well may be the case. My own MacBook right now, uh, not this one, my, my personal one, uh, the, the clock's dead. So every time I turn it on, which is like uh, once in every six months, it's like way out of sync. It's, it's showing like 1984 and stuff. So yeah, I have to readjust it every time because otherwise the SSL card figures are not valid. But anyway, yeah, in this case, the problem is the, the timestamp approach that we had just, just doesn't work, right? Because now you say the guy paused at 11 o'clock and now you're like jumping ahead seven hours. So what do you do? Get everyone to agree on the time. If everyone agrees on what the time is, there's no problem, right? But this is a, like, a significantly trickier set than done task. So let's let's delve into time synchronization for real this time, okay? So, this is what we're really going to be talking about today. It's the Network Time Protocol, or ETP. And regardless of whether you know about it or whether you don't know about it, it has more impact on your life than pretty much anything else you can name. All right? Let's talk more about this. So how can we get consensus among users on what the time is? That's basically the problem that NTP is trying to solve. Right? So yeah, you have one server, you have many users. You have users at the end of whatever protocol message exchange model that happens should agree on what the time is. How do you, how do you get them to do that? Right? So, some of you, if you've dealt with the uh, HTTP, might be going, like, what do you need a new protocol? Like, just call a request, get back a response, that's that's the time, right? Like, what's, what's the big deal? Okay, so let's let's walk it through, okay? Let's, let's, let's talk about it. So, you've got one user and you go one server, all right? User just goes, hi, can I have the time, please? And the uh, server gives back a response, this is the time. Anyone know what, what kind of time this is? This is like a valid time format, by the way. Okay, it's it's the time stamp from the NSA clock, right? Yeah. So this is basically the number of seconds that have elapsed since midnight of first January 1970. So yeah, th th this is like the default way of measuring time in, in, in any professional capacity. From this, you convert to all your time zones and such. All right. So yeah, you get the Unix clock uh, from the server and you adjust your time accordingly. What's wrong with this approach? Anyone know what's up? It's not safe. Uh, that's a possibility, but okay, uh, let's, let's, let's go deeper. So in this case, what you're waiting for is an RTP, a wrong trip time, right? You're just pinging, getting back a response. That's all you're waiting for. So any other guesses on what's wrong with this? I hear some whispers of latency. 
you, you guys are going to nail on the head, so I, I, won't, I won't torture you anymore. This actually works. This, this is a perfectly valid way of setting the time, all right? But there are some factors you have to consider. The first factor is precision. The second factor is precision. The third factor is precision. Ah, look at me, I'm uh, So basically, this, this way is not precise enough. Why is it not precise enough? Let's talk about it, right? So how long does this operation take? Okay, let's, let's think it through. So the first thing we'll do is a TCP handshake. Okay, uh, this is again 205 stuff, but basically if you're making any requests over the internet, the first thing you do is call the TCP handshake. Once the TCP handshake is done, only after that do you exchange this is information. Okay, so you've got a uh, TCP handshake. Let's just say it's an extra RTP, you know, say an RMS. Okay, then you've got the request RTP itself. So like the actual business information of like, hey, what's the time and this is the time. That's another 300 RMS. And the processing time, so the server itself will take some time, right? So let's say it's back up, uh, there's a fire in the data center, happens uh, happens more often than you will think. Uh, so that, that has a delay that's another tiny bit of seconds. And of course, there's a HTTP timeout. So this means that you know, your request can get trumpet somewhere, it's loading, it's refreshing, anyone who's done Modric. Do you guys do Modric? That was, that was how we signed up for modules back when I was a student here. <laughs> but basically, yeah, like if you've used any NUS website ever, you know how these websites time out, take long, maybe the response takes like 30, 40 seconds to come back. HTTP default timeout is usually 60 seconds. So your delay can be up to a minute, right? At which point, you're basically not even synchronizing clocks anymore. Like, what is a minute's error margin, right? So this is definitely unacceptable because the total time is broke. Yeah, it is, but I'm talking about why we can't use HTTP for first and synchronization specifically. Like this, this is not a chronological examination of why HTTP was invented. Yeah, that's that's a fair argument. Yeah, they, but I'm explaining why. Like, this is why we never dropped NTP and why we're still using it to this day. Like, why is it an industry standard? So, yeah, you're right. If HTTP could have done the job, then we would have switched over, but we didn't, so why not? Right? That's, that's basically the answer. Okay, so yeah, you could not live with your failure, and then that bring you back. <laughs> like we say. Okay, so NTP is a protocol for synchronizing time, uh, and it's built on top of UDP. So, uh, again, this is like slightly 205 stuff, but basically there's two transport layer protocols, UDP and TCP, that are commonly used. Um, NTP is built directly on top of uh, UDP, whereas most of your requests, like if you open and like, um, Instagram or Snapchat or whatever it is people are using these days, um, you're, you're sending a request over TCP, right? And it makes certain assumptions for this synchronization to be valid, right? So if these assumptions aren't holding, then NTP isn't actually the best, but you'll see why these are decent assumptions to make. So let's talk about these assumptions. The first one, it's a pretty major one, is time taken from the client to the server is the same as the time taken from the server to the client. This is called the symmetric networks assumption. And it's a pretty big one. It's a pretty easy one. Um, anyone here have seen this very Haskell video on why you can't measure the one-way speed of light? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So two people have. <laughs> okay, never mind. I'm, 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 I'm a different algorithms here. Anyway, yeah. So basically, uh, you need to have two synchronized clocks if you want to measure the one way speed of information transfer. And if you don't have synchronized clocks, it's impossible to measure the one way speed of anything. You can only measure the wrong trip time it takes. Like, think about it. Like, you and go with, like, let's say go with and I are trying to measure how fast someone runs, right? I have a timer, he has a timer, and we're both trying to time it. Unless both our clocks are synchronized, how can we know what time did he start here and what time did he end here, right? It's impossible to know. And the trouble with it is time synchronization is what we're trying to achieve. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem there. Okay. Second thing is we're assuming that everyone here has a stable monotonic clock. Stable means your clock doesn't pick up two seconds when in reality only one second has elapsed. Uh, monotonic means it's always increasing. It doesn't like get back down. So that's local reliability. And then finally, we have no rogue servers. So, like in this case, because it was Karina's own server, like we we we're not, we're not being malicious. But yeah, there's no there's no malicious servers at all. Okay, so there's a source of truth here. That's that's the third assumption. So now we're gonna get into NTP. There's gonna be some math. I'm gonna hold your hand. Don't worry. This is the inverse version. Okay. So there's a client. There's a server. Okay. 
So NTP relies on four tiny steps, all right? T1, T2, T3, T4, that's simple, okay? So let's say that currently they do not agree on what the time is. The phone thinks the time is zero, and the server thinks the time is 50. Not 50, but far but it's still 50. <laughs> <laughs> I, knew, I knew that joke would go over well in a room full of math nerds, but yeah, this is 50. Um, it doesn't matter what the units are, it could be seconds, it could be days, it could be uh, seconds from Linux, it all days from Linux, it doesn't matter. For our purposes, because we're not doing any multiplication, we're just doing addition in this case. So, yeah, they, they disagree on the time being different by 50. Okay, uh, obviously they can't carry each other, that's the whole point of this exercise, to get them to agree, all right? So, the first thing is, the phone logs a time called T1, all right? That's the first time step, T1, all right? And it will make a request to the server going, hey, I fired this request at T1. The time the server receives this request is called T2. Then the server has some processing, blah, 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 blah. It takes a while, it crashes, there's a fire. Gets past all of that right before it's about to send out a response, it will log T3. And then it will send out T1, T2, T3, all of that as the response, okay? And as soon as your phone receives it, it logs the time, T4. These are the four time steps, okay? Remember that these are local times, so the T1 and the T4 are measured on your phone, okay? And the T2 and the T3 are measured on the server. So that means that they will disagree. They, these are being measured on different clocks. They cannot possibly agree yet, okay? All right, so let's give it like numerical values, all right? So let's say it's 100, a 250, a 350, and a 400, all right? So remember, we made this very big assumption. This is entity's most fundamental assumption, it's a matter, right? So T2 minus T1, must be equal to T4 minus T3. All right, everyone with me so far? Great. But 150 is not equal to 50. What do you do in this case? So this means if these two sides are not equal, that means that the clocks are not agreeing with each other. If they're equal, that means everything's good. Hell with it, okay? But if these two are disagreeing, we have to do some adjustment, okay? So let's do the adjustment. So we add a delta constant to T1 and T4. Remember, T1 and T4 are measured on the client, so on the phone. So you can add a delta correction factor to it, right? So now these two sides are equal. Do the math, I trust you all with an algebra, you get two delta is equal to this thing, and then you get delta is equal to this, which means your delta is 50, all right? You can work it out if you want, I will, I will happily pass over my slides, but yeah, you, you get a delta of 50 in this case if, if the math works out correctly, right? Which means that the client time needs to be adjusted by 50. So what you do, you just shift it up by 50, so 100 becomes 150, 400 becomes 450, Boom, times are synchronized. Both the server and the client now have the same idea of what time is. Both of them will collectively say, hey, it's seven o'clock, right? That's basically what we want to achieve. So great, yay, cool, we got we got synchronized time. Done, right? Uh, ha, 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 not so quick. So how does the server know? <laughs> so, okay, this thing, I'm, I'm jumping a bit further ahead. For our purposes, it doesn't matter if the server knows the correct time or not. Like my server could be telling me it's 1973, but as long as all the people on the watch party agree it's 1973, it doesn't matter, right? So everyone just has to collectively agree on all time, but obviously for some other purposes, you would need to know the time. So how does the server know the time, okay? Well, um, it asks another server. And how does that server know the time? Oh, cool, you, you, you're you like my six-year-old nephew. Ask another server. <laughs> so is it, is it, is it servers all the way up and turns all the way down? So, well, there is a, terminating point to this chain. So NTP is built on this concept of a strata, or stratum, rather strata, plural, 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 well, that's a hard word to pronounce. Okay, so NTP is built on the concept of strata. So uh, every time you make a request, you can only request from something that's at a higher strata than you. So the numbers are in reverse order. So a strata two device asks to strata one, strata one asks to zero, and so on and so forth, okay? So Google, very benevolently, they run a free NTP service that anyone can use. That is a stratum one. So right now, if you run up an NTP client, I think it's like 10 lines on Python, just outside GPT. If you ping time.google.com, that one will give you a stratum one answer, making your computer a stratum two device at that point, okay? And if someone else comes to your computer and asks you, hey, what's the time? Congratulations, you now have a stratum two device making a stratum three device, okay? But then you get into the next level, which is how does a stratum one device know, right? Well, it asks a stratum zero device. <laughs> so what is a stratum zero device? A stratum zero device is either an atomic clock or 
and the connector of on the GPS, which is another connector for Korea. Okay? And why can't these guys go any further? Because going further than an atomic clock is not asking what is the time, it's asking what is time. Because it's an atomic clock, you're not getting any more accurate than that. If you want a higher degree of accuracy or granularity than an atomic clock, um, please tell me what you're working on. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because an atomic clock you're getting like in the order of magnitude of like 10 to the 12 um, years. So you, you, you're basically never ever drifting out of time ever, right? So if you ever get two atomic clocks together, you will see that they disagree, right? Atomic clocks do drift. They will drift on the order of like thousands of microseconds or nanoseconds. But you can't know which one is drifting faster or which one's drifting slower. Like that's that's basically impossible because, well, they're atomic clocks. What are you measuring it against, right? So what you do, you just take like 40 atomic clocks, average it out, well, fuck it, this is the real time, right? That's basically what we've all agreed to do. But essentially, at its core, an atomic clock is the time. That's, that's how accurate it gets. We're not getting any further accurate than that, right? And if two atomic clocks disagree, well, yeah, that's like, you know, the moment when like the smartest guy in the class is disagreeing with the professor, and they both like are doing, yeah, that's, that's basically what atomic clocks disagreeing is. You're not doing any better at that point. <laughs> okay. So the problem statement returns. We've, we've taken a long detour. We remember we were talking about watching Avatar together. So <laughs> let's go back to that. So 10 people from across the world voice call and what do we do together, right? So we see it can be done. We synchronize times, pause, play, everything can be done. Remember we talked about the slowing up and the slowing down and speeding up. Wow. Uh, you do that and, and yeah, people can have a happy watch party together. Then my boss throws in the final request, right? Because pauses. That it should work on a web browser. <laughs> anyone know what the problem here is? Anyone, anyone see it coming on the horizon? Hey, my man gets it. So, more specifically, NTP is built on top of UDP, and a browser will never let you access uh, UDP socket. It just doesn't. Yeah, security reasons. So, good luck. You're, you're stuck, right? And we had a fairly big uh, portion of our user base using um, the, the web client, which means, yeah, you, you, you should have a luck, right? Um, well, can we build a decent NTP service over TCP? Welcome to three weeks of my life in June. <laughs> right. So again, going back to this, there's there's a lot of issues here, right? So let's let's try to formalize this a bit. We've seen that it takes a while, but what assumption really is this breaking? Is is this causing a problem really? This is breaking an assumption. Do you know which one? I think my man gets it. Yeah, it's the first one. The the symmetric. Network's assumption. So it is possible in TCP because of how TCP is implemented. There's header domain blocking, there's rerouting, there's you know there's there's throttling in case the, the, the traffic is too high. So all of these factors that are built into TCP make it exceptionally asymmetric, right? So can you somewhat reduce the asymmetricity of TCP to make it work still? It can be done, right? So this is the problem with an asymmetric network. You never know where it is really, right? Was it like a request that was fired very fast? Was it the response that came really fast? Were they both like average out? Because when you try to average it out, you're, you're trying to move both together, right? And the problem with that is when you try to move together, but the center is not really in the center, they will still be off by the uh, asymmetricity of, of the request, right? So there are a few observations that will help us here, okay? These are, these are our guiding stones. So the first one is minimize the total time, right? Which is your P4 minus P1. If you're minimizing the total time, there's just a lower chance it's gonna be asymmetrical. Like it's still possible that it's asymmetrical, but it's just less likely, right? Both of these, the request and the response were very fast, very likely. If both took a while, it could be that they both ended up taking a while and it was a very symmetric request. Or it could be that just the request took forever and the response was immediately, right? So if you wanna reduce the asymmetricity, just, just use something with a small P4 minus C1. Second, average many results. So obviously one of them can be inaccurate, but many you need approaching the truth in that case, right? And the last one is that local clock drift is usually very, very, very teeny tiny. So we did the math and 99.99% of our users basically had no clock drift. They, a lot of them had no, like set the time differently. I think it was a fairly sizable number to be honest, but most of them had reliable clocks because you know, Samsung and, and uh, Apple make decent clocks in their phones. So because of that, you can actually trust the local clock to pick up 
every second quite reliably. You can't trust the time stamp it gives you, but you can trust the periodicity of each tick. So let's walk in those, okay? So the first rule, like I said, minimize your T4 minus T1 as much as possible, okay? So the, the one on the left is much, much, much preferred, even though like, if you do like the ratio, the, the latter is probably more um, symmetrical, but the first is still preferred, all right? The second is poll many, many, many times, keep improving your result, okay? So this brings up to something called the top filter algorithm. Basically, uh, the default implementation of MPP, right? That's the thing where you can plot the delta, which is the difference between your client and the server, and the T4 minus T1, so the time the total request takes, right? You plot these, you might get a graph like this. They only use eight data points. MPP only preserves the last eight uh, data points, okay? And you can draw this sort of filter. So there is some statistical method on how you draw these lines, and anything falling outside this line, you just disregard it, you just go there. That's, that's not a valid uh, data point. That must have been very asymmetrical somehow or the other. Right, and obviously, like I said, the the less the T4 minus T1 is, the more accurate. So in this case, we will use the first point. That one will be our source of truth, and you can average it out if you want to. There's a few ways of averaging it out. You can use a multiplicative weights update. Uh, anyone know that? Go in my study because they should be raising their hand. Yeah, uh, you can use a multiplicative weights uh, update method. You can use exponential relation. Um, either way, like there is some black magic to this. There will be like an alpha factor or you know some some ratio that you basically have to adjust and massage according to your needs. But it can be done. You can average it out and get a very accurate response. And the last thing you can do is you can do big changes with suspicion, even for small RTTs. Why? Because your local clocks tick up quite reliably. So it's very unlikely that your local clock just skip a second. Just very rarely that ever happens, right? So anytime there's a big jump. The higher chance is that your user is being malicious. So at that point, you assume that your existing time is correct, resynchronize, and you wait until this new timestamp arrives and go, okay, this is the new source of truth now because my user has fussed with the, with the timestamp, right? Okay, so let's talk about some takeaways. So even the simplest of projects are actually quite complex when you look at the implementation, right? So like, I'm pretty confident, like, most of you here, if you've ever worked with any kind of language, you just do like kind of now, right? Like in Python or JavaScript or whatever. There is an intense amount of coding behind that. Like that is intensely complicated, right? Don't even get me started on time zones. There's a lovely construct rant on YouTube. Like you can look it up, computer file, time zones. It's, it's a mess, right? That's, that's generally one of the most complicated things you can work with in computer science, especially if you're the one developing it. The second, sometimes you have no choice but to dig into the nitty gritty. Sometimes, like, you're, you're talking about a watch party feature, and then suddenly you realize, well, okay, I'm not talking about watch party at all. I'm reading papers on how they developed the uh, time synchronization protocols in the 1970s. And then time is really more of an opinion than a fact. Like, we want to think that the time right now is to, like, uh, 8.34, right? But my watch will tell you it's 8.35, and I don't know which one's more accurate. It's, it's really more of an opinion, okay? And the last one, you've got to make sure that your company continues green lighting your niche projects. Believe it or not, my project, we had done it. We were getting test data already. It was very, very good, okay? Remember my boss had set the target at 170 MS? We were under 100 MS in our average drip. So we had, like, excellent, excellent latency on this. And then my company axed it before we could launch it fully. So, <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm a TikTok these days. <laughs> Yeah, a big deal. Okay, so um, in case any of you want to do some further reading, I've got some uh, very interesting things over here. So the first one is about decision time protocol. So Facebook decides that NTP is not accurate enough because it's only accurate to like tens of milliseconds, whereas they were really looking for something on the order of microseconds. So they improve, like Facebook didn't write it themselves, but they have a blog on how they implemented it on their own, right? So they have atomic clocks inside their server room, and that's what they're using. Absolutely nuts, and, and yeah, you can you can read the engineering blocks. It's a great resource. The second one, this is like a kind of a tangentially related topic. It's called time smearing. So anyone here know what a leap second is? Okay, great. So for, for those of you not in the know, um, whoever decides what the time is, oh, they go like, okay, it seems like the Earth's rotation is not as fast as we expected. So therefore, we're just going to add one second to the time officially. So your clock will go 11.59.58, 11.59.59, and then it will go to 11.59.60, and then it will jump into the next day of zero, 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 zero. Make it make sense? I can't. But 
Google and Facebook and all these companies, they decided, you know what, time sharing is a better approach than just jamming in a leap second. Why? Because not everyone's accounting for it, right? Like, let's say you have some ancient Windows 95 system running somewhere, which is the backbone of your country's healthcare system or something like that, right? You cannot have things just going out of sync, right? That starts breaking systems at that point. Healthcare systems, it's okay to miss a second, but what if you're like a trading platform? Things are getting messy at that point, right? What if it's a financial transaction? What if it's Bitcoin? I mean, that's going to hell anyway. <laughs> but yeah, at that point, what they do instead is they don't just jump up a second. They increment very, very, very slightly over a long period of time, and they just smear the extra second over this, and they gradually sync up all the clocks and make sure that everyone is just slowly, gently easing in rather than leaping forward one second. Right? It's like if in a leap year we just said that, hey, every day is now exactly 17 seconds longer because that will add up to an extra day by the time we end, right? And I'll to that. So yeah, that's extra reading in case any of you are uh, fascinated by this topic and want to have a deeper dive. If not, yeah, thanks. That's, uh, you guys have been great. Uh, that's me, Ayush, on Telegram. If you guys want to ask more questions, chat, ask about career, whatever. Yeah, good game. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, of course. Because, I mean, yeah, that exposes uh, UDP directly, so you can use it. Um, but yeah, that delves into a whole other mess of things. So if you're still within the, the HTTP space and you're just like kind of trying to make it work, um, that was really the idea of this three weeks of exploration that we did. So we figured that, that it's good enough and, and it's possible. And uh, yes, sir. Um, not really, because we're only using uh, Unix timestamps. So those will kick up monotonically. Yeah. So yes, our clocks are shit. Our clocks are terrible. They will move back and move forward an hour. They, they make zero sense. There's extra seconds in random places. Unix timestamp is reliable. That's that's what we trust. So yeah, it's it's just using Unix timestamps synchronizes to local time zones. Yeah. Yeah. The the time of doing something else. Mm -hmm. Do you come out to do like something called NTS? Right. Um. I, I haven't done that. Sorry. What what is it? What's it called? Sorry. It's, uh, it's like NTT, uh -huh. but there's a bit of like POS inside the other I see. I, I haven't uh, dealt with that before. I'll have to dig into this. Yeah, yeah you know, there's a body box. Oh, okay, cool. Do you get accurate time? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't feel like it's going to Yeah, uh, on, on human skills, you wouldn't really know. It's really at the millisecond scale that it starts making a difference. But you will know if like, you're watching a video together and it starts it's, it's, drifting a lot. It's like a it's like made for a different call. Oh, I see. Okay, so what's the concern? Okay, okay, got it, got it, got it. It's so, like a security thing. Really. Sorry, it's just another question. Yeah, what's up? Yes. Um, the, the time that your application layer receives it. So even if it's buffered or anything, it doesn't matter. Like when the application layer receives it, it's business logic at that point, right? That's the code you write. So yeah, you can just measure that. So there might be it depends on how fast your service is. Yeah. Usually, like yeah, sure, really one MS, right? If if your code's well optimized, if you have multi threads, you should on your server, sure. But occasionally it's a bit longer than that. Yeah. So it really depends. Anyone else? If not, like, I'm right here, you guys can just work.